The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. And hello and welcome, it's Charles Christian here welcoming you to another episode of the Weird Tales radio show, number 76 for those of you who count. And with me is Janie. Hello. Thank you, Janie. (laughs) Wasn't asleep, honestly. (laughs) No, not at all. And uh, we're going to start with some roundup of little news stories. So I think Janie's got the first one. Well, I, I have some sad news, really. But um, Ballskine House, I'm sure everybody's heard of that and the connection, because it was indeed Alistair Crowley's former home. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, he lived there ooh, between 1899 and 1913. And um, it's burnt down again. It's burnt down again, yes. Yeah. Um, it's a B-listed Georgian building, just to kind of give you the picture. Mm-hmm. Quite, you know, quite attractive, but on nothing Loch, of... On Loch Ness as well, it is. Yes, I was coming to that All bit. Right. On Loch Ness, overlooking Loch Ness. Must, must have been spectacular. And, um, yes, the notorious Alistair Crowley lived there. But then uh, it was actually bought by musician Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin because of the Crowley connection. Mm-hmm. And um, he had it for a little while. I don't think he did very much. I mean, it was quite sumptuous and nice inside from the early pictures. Um, but he sold it on. And unfortunately, yes, in 2015, it it practically burnt to the ground. I think it had a bit of a roof on it. but um, It's just one wing, I think, was left after yeah, the first. Yeah, so it was pretty bad. Yeah. Um, anyway, so it, it was bought yet again by an anonymous owner. And um, they had plans. Uh, they had plans to open it, to you know, re- refurb it open it to the public, but now, no, practically there's nothing left. Um, I think something about some stables are, or a coach house is possibly left. And um, the idea for the current new owners, which was quite exciting, was to um, create a structure similar to the Witchcraft Museum in Bowcastle. Yes. Which is, where is that? Bowcastle. Bostcastle. Uh, Cornwall. Cornwall, yeah. Cornwall or Devon. Yep, yep, yep. Um, not heard of that. And, uh, yes, yeah, so um, apparently the, um, this is for Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, said the alarm was raised, was raised shortly before four o'clock on Wednesday and two appliances were sent to the property. And Police Scotland said it was believed the fire was started deliberately and has appealed for witnesses. Yes. Um, yeah, Blazes. I think the earlier fire was probably arson as well, the 2015 one. Yeah, and the new owners, it was only announced a couple of weeks ago that the new owners had purchased it. Mm. Yes, yes, it's well, it's not suspicious, but it's it's slightly weird, isn't it? The way this keeps mm. happening, and you know, it seems yes. to be nope, you know, not in any way going to develop that further. Um, I mean, he was uh, <coughs> Crowley, as everybody knows, he died in 1947, was infamous in the late 19th century, early 20th, for his promotion of the occult. Mm-hmm. Um, during World War I, though, he wasn't very popular. He wrote anti-British propaganda for some reason. But anyway, uh, yeah, yes. Well, there was a suggestion he was working as a double agent. <gasps> oh, yes. Yes, yes I, I remember that now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, the occult, what yes. is their connection? He, 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 Probably he, not. He, he had his um, temple of Thelema. He did. Ah, that was in the Mediterranean, but he did have, I believe, temple facilities there, ritual uh, altars and the like. And in one of his books, he does say that it would never thrive in Bolskine or something. Huh. Like, uh, he Lord. seemed to have had a premonition that it would go down in flames. Oh. 
Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It was also an experienced climber, apparently. Oh, yes. It was part of the ill-fated attempt to scale K2. It's the second highest mountain, I think, in the world. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so ongoing inquiries on that. But mm. um, if you feel moved by this sad tale, the new owners have opened a sort of crowdfunding type page yep. and they want to raise 1.2 million to rebuild the property uh, for this witchcraft museum, I imagine, or such mm. like. Anyway, uh, it's actually on gofundme.com yes. and they're, they're going for £220,000 of which they've raised 17,261. Mm-hmm. Yep. So there you can go yeah, find them. I think them there's there. also fr- a Friends of Bolskeen House oh, there is. Um, um, Facebook group. Or yes. Certainly you'll find it on social media. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, anyway, thank so you very much. Watch that space. Indeedy. Or watch that ruin. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and there we are. That's that little bit. Mm-hmm. And my next piece... Yeah, next piece... Is France seeks science fiction writers to help future proof its military against science fact. This is an interesting one. Mm-hmm. Um, read a report online. Don't know the veracity of it, but anyway, we'll, we'll just go with the flow. I, I think there's, it's true because there is an actual link through. Oh, to I didn't follow you, that link. Yeah, there, there, it's in French, uh, but there is an uh-huh, actual link uh-huh. to the French. Uh-huh. Military. Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. Yes, the um, French army apparently is they're looking to recruit four or five sci-fi writers and futurologists to staff a red team that predicts future threats um, and how to disrupt or defend against them. And the... Oh, I can say stuff in French words here. Yes, it would be... Excuse my accent, any French people. Anyway, the unit will be run by the L'Agence Innovation de France and the DGRIS, which is the Defence Strategic Unit. And there'll be the writers, anybody out there listening, uh, will be expected to propose scenarios of disruption and to consider the impact of disruptive technologies and the use of asymmetric technology like artificial intelligence by state and non-state actors. I don't think they mean actors, no. as in actors, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> but the point is, well, they might do, I don't know, because no, it's, don't, it's no. kind of very movie scriptish, isn't it? It, it is, no, it is, it is a it's term, not, but, but state some, actors. Some, yes, yes, but, you know. Basically the North Koreans. Okay. <laughs> and the Chinese. No, 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 no. There we go. And the uh, Russians. No, <laughs> Well, everybody, really. And the Americans. <laughs> and the, <laughs> and the French, face. actually. Yes, They're quite all, strong on it. <laughs> all scrapping as usual. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't understand that, the use of asymmetric technology. Because asymmetric to me means um, just the opposite of symmetrical. So it's yes. obviously a term of art that I don't understand quite what they mean by that. But anyway, that's completely irrelevant. Nobody's interested. And... Um, yeah, so apparently, though, it's not the first time the military has turned to fiction writers. Apparently, the US Department of Defense and CIA reportedly got some Hollywood screenwriters and directors on board after the 9 11 attacks to brainstorm possible future terrorist attacks. Mm-hmm. Apparently, we haven't been able to quite confirm these meetings, but then again, one would rather hope they were secret. Yes. Quite frankly. But I, I, yeah, I'm not wishing to nip this obviously as you know mm-hmm. that's not me no no no, no. not but mrs skeptic at no, all no 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 well jetpacks i just like to say jetpacks mm-hmm. first mentioned by sci-fi writers in the 1920s mm-hmm. we'd all be having them wouldn't we mm-hmm. we'd, we'd all be scooting around in our jetpacks mm-hmm. you know, half a mile above the ground mm-hmm. whizzing about and in our flying Cars. Well, I'm, yes. s- I'm still waiting. Well, still waiting for my jetpack. Well, it's funny you should say that because there, uh, last week, that's in terms of when you're listening to this show, last week, uh, Frankie Zapata, a French inventor, successfully flew across the English Channel on a jetpack. Okay. So that's a sort of a long side, you know, the first yeah, little, little biplane thing. going across the. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Um, 
it can't does, be long. It can't. Yeah, well, be. It, it does seem to have a few limits on it. That uh, it's very heavy on fuel, and so he had to stop in the middle of the channel and put down on a boat to refuel. Yeah, yeah. And he did try it the week earlier, but missed the boat and ended in the water. And the other side that you might think not a good idea if you're military is the fuel pack is a backpack that the uh, flyer has. Mm. So you're basically flying along Long on a little with jet pad um, with a large tank of air. Two star petrol. <laughs> petrol on Diesel. the back. Diesel. <laughs> Aviation fuel. What could possibly go, go wrong? wrong. Yes. yes. Yeah. But still, interesting. So... Um, Let's see what happens. Indeed. And will, will they be um, working out in the way of these sci-fi stories which of the soldiers at the end are going to get... They've only got a bit part, you know, where they'll yes. be able to predict who's going to get <laughs> got by the aliens or whatever. And yes. Who's the romantic lead? No, I'm just being silly yes. now. No, apparently there was a conference uh, held by the National Science Division of the US Army Research Laboratory, and it was predicted in last year that inside of two decades, humans will be just one species of intelligent beings on the battlefield, along with robots, sensors, smart weapons, autonomous we vehicles, and it says rather vaguely, and wearable things. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I suppose that's that's just 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 sort of those ecto suits or something. Yes. I don't know. They're mm. kind of penetrable. To, yeah. Yes. They have their own little ecosystem in there. Well, there's a nice thing to look forward to, isn't it? Exactly. Mm. And if you do want to follow the uh, French invitation, there is a website link. You can actually find it on an article on the. Uh, online news site at the register for the 19th of July and uh, they have the link there but it's uh, there is a there is a there is a, a, a long link and um, you can get a, a PDF and an application form to Good say point. I'm a futurist I know <laughs> of the future well of weapons there's something for you to do tonight isn't there? <laughs> well exactly yes <laughs> And before we go, we did have some people saying some very nice things about the show uh, recently, and I think it's only fair we should mention Jason Wick oh, at oh, GoatPenStudios.co.uk, who is the person who puts these shows together. Otherwise, there'd be more ummings and errings and splutterings and coughings, mm. and there are already. Yes. Big up, Jay. Big up, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's absolutely brilliant. He's really masterful. Yeah. And uh, no, I can't say enough good stuff about him. It's just excellent. Yeah. You can also find him on Facebook at Goat Pen Studios. And um, thank you very much, Janie. Yeah, you're welcome. Your work here is done. And now for our interview with the Norwich-based poet and artist Helen Ivory, who I've known for uh, many years now, who I used to be involved in the Norwich poetry scene. And she has a new book out called The Anatomical Venus, which is our starting point. However, I have to begin with a confession that when we were recording this, there was a blip in the recording. So the first few parts, uh, minutes of the interview have been lost forever. However, I do have some notes on them. And uh, where it begins is that Helen had a collection out in 2012 uh, called Waiting for Bluebeard, which was a semi-autobiographical piece about living in an abusive relationship where an element of the abuse is the partner, the bluebeard, uh, the man who keeps you in his castle, treats the woman and tries to convince the woman that, that she's abnormal, weird, and that really he needs to look after her and control her. Anyway, Helen saying that when she was reading... Um, 
from Bluebeard's Castle and touring the country. Uh, she found lots of women approaching her and saying, yep, yeah, that happened to me. Um, I was in an abusive relationship and my partner tried to make out I was mad or weird or different. And this then led on to the Helen to look into the idea of women being portrayed as other, as being not quite normal. And uh, various stories she's looked at, the way they were treated in Victorian asylums, where hysteria was uh, solved, cured, by feeding the women a lot of food. And as one doctor said... Uh, he was treating an anorexic woman in a Victorian asylum and remarked that she'd got better and put weight on, had lost her sexual allure and her vul vulnerability. Um, and I say it becomes very clear from some of these readings that men were scared of women and couldn't quite work them out and it's terrified them, and it also, one of the consequences was the persecution of witches, who by very nature were outsiders, literally, in some instances, living on the outside of a village, doing things other people didn't. And uh, Helen looks at the Malleus Maleficarum, the Hammer of the Witches, which was the witch hunter's Bible for several hundred years and probably single-handedly responsible for thousands of women on the continent being hanged or burned at the stake for being witches. Uh, Helen also goes in to look at the uh, Essex witchcraft trials, the um, proceedings. Uh, this was Matthew Hopkins, the witch, notorious witch finder general's activities. And uh, there's lots of other things she uncovered, such as some rather strange medicine, uh, anatomical ideas um, that took hundreds of years for people to catch on with. And one of them was the idea of that women have a wandering uterus or wandering womb that moves around the body. And as a result, depending where the womb is at the time, it affects the woman's mind and actions. Um, yes. On the whole, this is a quote from a Francis Adams in as late as 1856, saying, on the whole, the woman is like an animal within an animal. So um, it, was, it was these elements that uh, led Helen to look into the concept of the othering of women, treating them as other than normal human beings. And it's the background for the anatomical Venus. The other aspect of the anatomical Venus is she uses the... Um, concept of the wonder camera that's the cabinet of curiosities uh, some kinds there were just cabinets but most times uh, it was a small room and indeed the original meaning of cabinet was a small room where people would put all their little exhibits in there uh, well men would put their exhibits things they'd found things they'd purchased on their travels and it was very much a view that women were also rather consigned to being objects to be observed and looked at as if they weren't human. Anyway, uh, we start off with Helen reading a couple of poems from the collection and then the discussion goes on from there. And I say, once again, apologies for the fact that uh, there was a technical hitch. The title of this poem um, is from Exodus 7.11. Thou shalt not suffer a sorceress to live. For her neighbour's sickness was more than merely unnatural, for he sang perfectly without moving his lips. For she is intemperate in her desires and pilfers apples from the orchard, for she hitches her skirts to clamber the fence. For her womb is a wandering beast, for she is husbandless and at candle time brazenly trades with the devil. For she spoke razors to her brother, who has looked upon her witch's pap and the odious suckling imp. 
For the corn is foul teeth, for the horse is bedlam in its stable, for the black cow and the white cow are dead. Mm -hmm. And... Yes. Um, it's that one. Yes. So this poem has a little quote, a handy quote, from the Reverend Kramer and Sprenger, um, from the Malleus Maficarum of 1486, which says, to conclude, all witchcraft comes from carnal lust, which is in women insatiable. The hanged woman addresses the Reverend Heinrich Kramer. Do you cower in your crib at night against encroaching evil tongues? I picture you skittish inside your nightgown as swollen tempers swoop upon your roof and rattle the door you bolted thrice against the dark invisible. You said my womb knew such hunger that I might devour a man entire. Pray tell me in your clearest chapel voice what tales they told you at the breast. A pretty devil's pack that will render your creeping flesh delicious. A sow of wind stirs papers on your desk. You say women have weak memories, then you shall be perplexed that despite my ruined body in the noose, I recall each gnawing passage of your book. When the sun awakens, they will cut me down. Do you have another piece you want to Yeah. Read? Um, hold on a sec. Oh, yeah, this is the what we were just talking about um, to do with medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this would segue better as to what we yeah. were just talking about. Um, so again, this poem has a nice little quote from the Reverends Kramer and Sprenger from the Malleus Maficarum of 1486. And... Um, it says, if a woman dare cure without having studied, she is a witch and must die. So they were really, really coming for these, <laughs> these hedge witches. Mm -hmm. So um, this is cunning. She comes when summoned with birth blood and earth caked the hem of her skirts and dark little half moons packed under broken nails. The hedgerows are her pantry. To quicken labour there is cockspur, balm of poppies to assuage your pain. Her senses are sharp as hoarfrost. She will bid you when to squat like a brute. And when the physician invents himself, he will call at your door in the empirical light of day with his bag full of leeches and head full of planets. He will scribe the words of the Lord into your waxing belly. And when your daughter happens her crowning, he will rip off her head with forceps. Now, if you've seen the horrific <laughs> instruments, the forceps in a, um, a kind of... Um, where did we see these? Maybe I think I saw them in the Hunterian Museum. Just mm -hmm. these vile instruments, you know, yeah. the, these, um, that these babies are brought into the world with, you know. Um, so that, that's what inspired my, that, that, last, um, that last image. Mm, mm. Do you think you are now done with um, <laughs> women as other, or are you? Um, I don't know. I don't you, know what. You said it was several years between yeah, the, yeah. this collection and the previous collection. Yes. Bluebeard. Yeah, I don't know what my next thing is. Mm. <laughs> um, I, in fact, since I finished writing this um, this book, which is actually, I mean, the you know, finish writing something and, and the time it takes to be published, because mm -hmm. my publisher publishes other people too. Yes. <laughs> um, so it's taken maybe kind of eighteen months, I think, from yeah. from that point to that point, and I've written a um, a chat book. Um, for Sir Vision Press, um, which is called Maps of the Abandoned City, which um, imagines a city that people have bought, uh, have bought, have built. Mm -hmm. It imagines a city that people have built um, and left. Mm -hmm. So everything um, that they created, all of the all of the animals that live there in the zoos, 
um, the art galleries, it's ca they're carrying on without the people there. Um, and that was a, um, and it, be, because the anatomical Venus was very much about research, I, I did so much reading behind most of these poems in here. Um, the maps of the abandoned city was very much about imagination, you know, and I'm just kind of, I, I, I had the I had the, the, the set, the setting, I knew you know, the the umbrella. Yeah. Um and um I just had fun with it and I wrote those poems probably in about four four or five months. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah and yeah, and it was fun. It was just all about the imagination. Well it's fun in an apocalyptic way. <laughs> <laughs> much you know people have all gone everything's ruined they've ruined things um yeah it was it was, it was more about imagination well, i mean I, the anatomical venus is of course about imagination but it's kind of the you know there's less research in the in the maps um, yeah. Home. yeah but i i don't know what will come next i don't really don't know what will come next i do need um i'm going to be working um with um an artist Paul Marsh and we're we're making a um, an exhibition, a kind of words and image exhibition. Um, that's apocalyptic too. There's a theme <laughs> to, to my life at the moment. It's a it's a it's an end of the world, end of the pier show, mm -hmm. and um, it, there's a kind of ringmaster's voice saying, you know, kind of roll up, roll up, and this kind of hell and damnation is going to be happening. So I'm kind of doing. <laughs> Now and um, carn carnival barkers and um, you know strong men and all of that kind of stuff, um, contortionists, magicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm doing that um, at the moment. But I don't, you know, that I think I need to to do something completely different in between collections, really. But I don't know what the next project's going to be. Mm. I did think in the in this the research for the the project that I'm doing with Paul I did think that um maybe I I might write about a female magician mm -hmm. um but I don't know yet mm -hmm. I don't know it might be just one of those flights yes and I mean talking about your other projects you what 2015 you did a special tarot deck I did, yeah. Tom Freston. Yeah, Tom de Freston. Um, yeah, we, we just did, we didn't do the whole tarot because it's quite a big project. Yes. <laughs> um, we did the um, the major arcana. Yeah. And I was, I started off making assemblages and, and poems and combining them. And I was putting them on Facebook. Um, you know, just, just of tarot. I wasn't, I hadn't, I don't know what I'd done. I'd done some swords and maybe a few yeah. cups. Um, and Tom um, contacted me and asked him whether I'd be interested in working on a project together because he, he was also interested in the, you know, the, the tarot. And I've, yeah, I've, I've been, I don't know, there's just something, I think I first did the tarot when I was a goth teenager, like everybody does. <laughs> um, but there, there's something, because it's the archetypes and the, I don't know, it's something, something again, it's, it's otherworldish, isn't it? Mm. It's otherworld, but it's within us because our archetypes are within us, but not mm. with, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, we, we made the major arcana and um, I think the idea... I, that was quite a lot of research as well for writing the poems of that I do loads of reading um, mm -hmm. about a particular card and um, let that all somehow comp compost down and then try and find a vo the voice that I was going to be writing in um, and I didn't oh, I was kind of mindful because people I mean people love the tarot and people who actually use the tarot um all the time so i was mindful to be respectful to that but also to try and have my own individual response to it mm -hmm. um so i have no idea if i've done that <laughs> i just i just did what i did and tom did what he did and um they seemed to um, had quite good reviews and we sold it we, we made them actually 
as um, a, a little um, little box. Um, Gatehouse Press published it, and it's yeah, it's a beautiful object. And yeah, we have sold quite a few, and um, yeah, people. I think people like them. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they're still available? Yeah, they're still available. What what, are, what would people look for? What are they um, called? Um, it's called Fool's World. Right. The actual pack, because the idea yeah. that the fool will inherit, <laughs> right. inherit the world once he completes his journey. Yes. Um, I don't know who came up with that. It was Tom or me, I don't know. Um, yeah, so if you, if you Google Fool's World, and on, or even if you go onto the Gatehouse Press right. website, you should be able to get a box yeah. from there. Okay, and then moving on, uh, one of your other things you are known for are your, I suppose we'd call them assemblages. Yeah. <laughs> which are particularly weird. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. I think that I think that they come from my fascination with the Wonder Camera and the Cabinets of Curiosity. Yeah. And also um, because the, as I said, um, they're the precursor to the museum. So mm. you bring everything into one space. Yeah. But once you do that, then the things that you're putting together, they might not necessarily belong together. Yeah. So you've got this um, kind of odd jostling, this kind of juxtaposition. They make different stories, you know, mm. um, which I, th I think these things are a little bit like poems as well. You know, when you're making things with words, they are, they are ready-made and you're bringing them together and making a new thing. Mm -hmm. um, which you know the, the, these assemblages are, are as well but also what I like about the assemblages um, most of the things that I use have been foraged and you know found so it's recycling yeah. <laughs> and um, they've, they've all got their own stories um, do you, I, one, of my, one of my spirit guides is Bagpuss yeah. you know Bagpuss <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I just I, there aren't very many episodes of Bagpuss. I, I, I wrote um, a poem. I think a Sestina, Bagpuss Sestina, because um, the the mice. If for anyone who's not familiar with Bagpuss, um, the, the there's mice on a mouse organ, and mm -hmm. um, they. So somebody, Emily, um, who's Bagpuss's, I don't know, owner, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, brings an object into the shop and, and bad person, his friends usually have to work out what it is and what its story is and where it came from and they invent all kinds of things you know things that are you know believable things that are really mice really is that yes. what you think <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah just kind of in, invention and, um, and stories I don't know I'm just going to say a few abstract words now, yeah. but you know it's just 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 the things and I, I like um the assemblages are usually in boxes so I like the idea of making some kind of order mm -hmm. um which is a, again what poems do mm -hmm. you know you try and try and give us give some kind of shape to your chaos yeah. um really yeah, yeah. and uh You've done an Arthur Me series. Mm -hmm. Now Arthur Me is best known for those guides he wrote of England. Arthur yeah. Me's England, what was in the 1930s, I think. Yes. Which have masses of detail about yeah. obscure things. Yes. And, you know, yeah. He's, he's a fantastic educator and um, I've got well, I've kind of cut about a lot of <laughs> <laughs> Arthur Mee children's encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. And there's just, I mean, the, the language is from another time. And he's mm. really massively enthusiastic about education. And, the, yeah, the, his language is ebullient. He uses mm -hmm. words like wondrous and splendour and words like that. So, uh, so my, uh, my Arthur Me series, I mean, that, that's a kind of a, um, an odd little, um, they're odd assemblages, aren't they? But mm -hmm. I also make collage poems using um, so, some lines from the Arthur Me um, juxtaposed with um, fairy tale, lines from fairy tale books and 
and lines from women's uh, magazines of the kind of 40s, 50s, 60s, mm-hmm. housewifey, you know, yes. talking to the yeah. housewife. So that kind of goes in with a fairy tale. And yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I like the way that these different modes of speaking, um, they have, they butt up against each other and you can make things happen um, and yeah, just set set the. I don't know what. I I like kind of odd connections that are completely logical. This is why I don't. I, the the word um, surreal, which is sometimes thrown at me, <laughs> yeah. I don't like because um, because I, I I don't like to think. I don't like to think I'm irrational. <laughs> <laughs> so I think when you're making a collage poem, which I do, um, you're because we try to make sense. I think mm-hmm. generally in life um, and you try to make a story um, so I'm taking lines in one place and lines to another and I'm thinking um, yeah that's quite amusing but also it makes sense mm-hmm. you know it's got to there, there's got to be a logic um, yeah so yeah I, I do that I've, start, I've started making um, making felt animals as well um, I've made quite a lot of mice Yes. Mice were very popular on Facebook. Yeah. Um, I sold mice. I've now made a mermouse. So, and I'm making, I'm making, I'm making some winged mice. Um, so the the idea initially, well, that I'm going to get to is to make some little tableaus. I don't know if you've seen the Walter Potter um, tableaus of taxidermy. Yes. Yes. These Victorian kind yes. of, you know, kittens in school rooms and, yes. you know, these poor little drowned kittens that yes. <laughs> kind of, yeah, made into assemblage of life. So, so I'm, yeah, I want to put, want to put some, some felt animals into these little tableaus uh, as well. Maybe the last supper with mice or something like that. <laughs> Place of cheese on the table. I don't know. I don't yes. know. But it, it's, I just like play really. And that's kind of part of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I like, yeah. Just strangeness in play. <laughs> <laughs> and what about your own um, personal experiences? What attracts you to the weird? And um, I mean, I, other, other than obviously life's... <laughs> other than group, otherness. Otherness. Yeah. <laughs> other than otherness and other than otherworldliness. Um, when I, I was a kid, I mean, we lived in a, in a house um, with ghost cats. Mm-hmm. Um, I never saw any. Everybody in my house saw the ghost cats. My cats used to have fights with invisible, you know, cats. Yeah. Um, so there was that. There was this kind of thing going on. Also, um, my um, my mother, and basically the female, the female people in our family um, used to do Ouija board. Right. And I... I did. I mean, I was I was kind of doubting this whole thing, you know. Mm. Even though my finger was on the glass and I could feel it being moved around quite swiftly. Yeah. Um, there was this one character who who said he was um, he was called Jacob. I think he was a hangman. There was something, but I thought he, it's someone trickstering, someone trying to, you know, yeah. whether it was you know somebody from the other side or somebody in the room. It was someone messing about. Yeah. And in my head, I said, I don't believe you. Yeah. And I, I really want some kind of sign, you know, some energy, some... And then nothing really happened. You know, the the, um, the Ouija just carried on and he, he went away. Um, I think he said a few wor- rude words and, yeah. <laughs> and then went away. And then later, um, I, it was... I mean, how old was I? I think I was 16 or 17. Um, in my in my makeup bag, I had a, a bottle. It was a concealer bottle. And it was normally kind of a long and thin, but it had been blown up into a, into some kind of orb. Yeah. You know, it, the whole... is like some heat had been inside and kind mm-hmm. of completely blown it out. And that freaked me out a little, I must yeah. say. <laughs> Actually, you know, I said never hadn't, you know, I didn't say any of this stuff out loud anyway. So, yeah, that's it. That's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I did with it. I think I just throw it outside. I just, no, 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 no. That's, that's peculiar. <laughs> but it was definitely energy. It was definitely something. Hmm. <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, your collection 
the anatomical Venus that can be purchased. It can be purchased from Blood Axe Books. Blood Axe Books, which is my publisher. Yeah, and um, presumably on Amazon. On as well. Amazon, the book depository. Um, yeah, all yeah. over the place, really. Yeah. Right. Well, Helen, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for that. And um, good luck with the future. <laughs> Live long and, and prosper. <laughs> with your felt mice. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, certainly. Um, I'll tell you about it. Yeah. Are you recording? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the last person to be imprisoned under the British Witchcraft Act of 1735 was um, a woman called um, Victoria Helen McRae Duncan, and this was in 1944. Um, and she was a medium. So this is 1944, so... Um, people, women, wanted to talk to the, their sons, their husbands, people who had died in the war. Mm. Um, and she was called Hellish Nell. This is the story she supposedly had inside knowledge of a battleship being sunk yeah, and it. was yeah. talking about it when yes. it was still... I haven't been released to the public. Yes, it was yeah. Thought that she would spread dismay and yeah, yeah. which is presumably why they banged her up. Yes, <laughs> yes, and, and I say uh, I, I do know her sort of adherents are still campaigning for her to, her to have a um, a pardon. Yes, for it. yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea, because she was quite, um, she wasn't like a fame medium. No. You know, she was quite a kind of sturdy working class woman. Yeah. Um, and and some of the reading that I've done about her, um, she did, she did self-harm. And I, I think that she, um, I know, I, I, with this poem, I, I kind of wanted to get a bit of the struggle in the what, um, what she, what she, the, 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 um, I don't know, what do you, what do you call it? The ability, um, of mediumship that she had. Um, so the struggle of that and then wanting, people wanting to see, you know, people mm. wanting the theatre, um, you know, they wanted the whole thing as a performance. So what, what mediums must actually have to do to make the whole thing a spectacle. It couldn't be some quiet knocking, mm. you know, it mm. had to mm. be something big. So I kind of ha have this struggling in this poem. Um, and it, yeah, shall I just read it? Mm -hmm. This is hellish Nell. They plead with me to birth their dead for them. What mother could refuse a sister mother? So I allow their soldier boys to use my voice to shape their cheery valedictions. But the mothers, they want to see their angel boys, to touch their faces one last crowning time. I must get theatrical, says my spirit guide. Then comes cheesecloth, egg white, ectoplasm, leaking from my breast, the labour stows, the de delivering of a shroud into the world. And their mouths agape like greedy fish. Is that him, my baby? Oh yes, they gulp it down. In quiet times without all eyes on me, I am forced to reconsider what is spirit, what is nature. I am unsteady with it all. And so I make a meal of carpet tacks to weigh me to the floor. I deserve this pain for sullying the gift bestowed on me by God. Now dim the lights if you really want to show. See the candles burning vacancies into my meat. Does my brashness disturb you? You would prefer me fay. Stand back. I might regurgitate all hell into your choking auditorium. Say that at the end of the reading and drop the microphone and walk out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With the lights go out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was lovely. You're listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian.
Something Wicked This Way Comes. Weird Harvest Press presents Harvest Hymns, the sweet fruits and twisted roots of folk horror, a two-volume set of books investigating the music of folk horror, featuring contributions from some of the biggest names in the field, Candia McCormack, Johnny Trunk, Maddie Pryor, Sharon Krause, Jim Jupp and Kemper Norton, to name just a few. Available now via lulu.com. 100% of all weird Harvest Press profits are donated to wildlife charities. Welcome, fool. You have come of your own free will to the appointed place. It is time to keep your appointment with the Wicker Man. The Wicker Man. If you want to grow your business, save time using the latest tech, and look great online, Weird Appeal Digital can help. We have a free, yes, that's free, download listing 40 digital tools, apps, and resources to help you grow your brand, promote your project, generate leads, and reach your audience. Just go to www.appeal.digital slash weirdtales for smart, effective digital design and your free download go to www.appeal.digital slash weirdtales News of two events you uh, may want to make note of and if you're in the right area or at least the right country you may want to attend. Uh, first up chronologically speaking on the 8th of September, that's a Sunday by the way, uh, at Woodbridge which is in the east of England uh, we have Colonel Charles Holt returns to Woodbridge. Now Colonel Holt is a retired US Air Force colonel and he was in charge of base security were during what was known as the Rendlesham Forest UFO encounter. This is the UK's equivalent of Roswell, happened way back in 1980. A lot of confusion and misleading stories, but I say Colonel Holt actually wrote the official report for the US military on it. So uh, he knows the facts. It's an all-day event, uh, price £20, UK that is, and there will be other speakers. Uh, if you're interested, contact via email David Young. You can find David at davidyoung2qn at yahoo.co.uk. UK, or you can phone David on 01728 633 Say that's the 8th of September. And uh, closer to home, next week we'll be interviewing David Young to talk about the Rendlesham Forest affair. And then we have the first Spellcon event. This is on the 19th of October. And it's at Katie's of Smithtown, which is in Main Street, Smithtown, New York, which is on Long Island. And the event is dedicated to all things paranormal and occult. There'll be various experts uh, in occult fields, as well as various artists, performers and vendors. The message I've been sent here says, oh, and did we mention the venue is haunted? Oh, no, you didn't. But you have now. The people from the Spellcast podcast will be present. Uh, there will also be people from the Obscure Anomalies podcast. And there will also be Black Sam Bellamy, who is not the ghost. He is a band named after a pirate. Anyway, I say it's on Saturday, October the 19th. Runs from two in the afternoon through till 11 in the afternoon. Uh, pricing is $10 plus tax if you book in advance. $15 uh, on the door. And there's also a VIP, which is $15 plus tax or 20 on the door. 
and you can find more information about it on Eventbrite and you can also find by going on Twitter and have a look at the Spellcast pod. So Twitter at Spellcast pod. Lots of information there. Uh, there's also a phone number 631 415 8126. So I say that's the first of the annual Spellcon events, 2 till 11 pm, Saturday, October the 19th on Long Island. <laughs> England, home to zombies, werewolves, green-skinned fairy folk, and how about dragons, strange monoliths and vampires? If you're fascinated by the bizarre and unexplained, join Charles on a road trip around the newly discovered Walled Newton Triangle, where fact is much weirder than any fiction. Check out Charles Christian's fantastic Kindle book, a travel guide to Yorkshire's weird worlds on Amazon.co.uk and Amazon.com. And time has run out for us. It only remains for me to say thank you very much for listening to the Weird Tales radio show. We do appreciate that. We'll hope you'll listen again next week and we'll be back with more tales of the paranormal to uh, thrill and delight and um, one final thought the moon has awoken from the sleep of the sun the night has been broken the spell has begun good night black shark The demon dog of East Anglia is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. You can keep in touch with us online at www.weirdtalesradio.com by email to weirdtales at icloud.com and on Twitter at Urban Fantasist. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Good night. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.